Okay, Unit 10 has a, a pretty decent amount of information that we need to cover. Um, there's several names of theorists and their theories that we need to go over for Unit 10. Um, the theme for Unit 10 is obviously personality, um, which is very highly theoretical. So there's a lot of different uh, personality theories and theorists. So let's get into the topics within personality. What is a personality? Is it something that's unique to humans? Um, if you look at the definition, it is behavioral, but it is also attitudes, it's emotions, things that characterize you, the individual. If you look at ideographic method, methods, excuse me, for testing personality, um, you have things like personality assessment techniques. You have um, uh, observing people in various social settings or scenarios. Um, but you also have um, you have various ways through interviews, case studies, and things like that. The most common way to assess personality, though, um, is the, is uh, through personality um, tests or personality profiles. Um, you get the Myers Briggs personality uh, type indicator. You get the Big Five uh, personality trait um, assessment, and and that those are the probably the most common ways to do it. Those are what's called factor analyses. Um, and basically, they identify clusters of of trait dimensions. Um, and, and, and group variables, so they group people together. If you look at the bottom here, you have um, the Myers-Briggs types, you have you know, uh, people like the adventurer and the performer, disciplined, those are the different personality profile types. So in Myers-Briggs, you have four different characteristic traits that you fall into based on how you score. Um, and in the Big Five Personality Trait Index, which is Hans Eysenck's um, canoe model or ocean model, um, there's five, obviously. So if you take this to its most basic biological function, uh, you would have to look at how a biological or evolutionary psychologist would look at personality traits. Um, if it was something that evolutionary, uh, if it was evolutionary, then obviously it would it would it would be the theory that your personality traits would help you survive or help you reproduce or help you bond, uh, connect with other people um, as part of your interaction with your environment, we'll say. So biological personality psychologists would study the extent to which heritability determines our personality. Um, that's that word we saw in a previous chapter. That's the extent uh, that something is the result of genetics 50% of the time. So for instance, the example of the, the plants, the sunflowers, uh, if they have the same environmental conditions and some of the plants are twice as tall as the other ones, then, then it has to be a biological difference because the environment is the same. So that's heritability. And the converse is also true. If they have the same genetic uh, makeup as plants or a species of animals, uh, then whatever the personality differences would, would be environmental. So there are a lot of things that people tend to just assume that are genetic and built into us. Like that is, oh, she was born that way. That's her genetic bi biological personality trait like being introverted or extroverted. And that may be biological, but there's also a, a, a good bit of research data and indicators that show that, that a lot of personality is, is actually environmentally influenced as well. So when you look at heritability, it's estimates from twin and adoption studies suggest that both heredity and environment have about equal roles in determining at least some of our personality characteristics. Um, and that doesn't sound very profound, but it means that when you eliminate confounding variables like genetics, and that would be a person who was born to biological parents but raised by adoptive parents, um, and some personality profiles, they turn out like their adoptive parents and not like their biological parents, and so that would point to environment. But there are other personality traits that are genetic, and they run throughout people in spite of whether or not they've even met their biological parents. So there are things about us in our personality that are biological and things that are environmentally influenced. And of course, uh, you look at an example of, of an evolutionary psychologist, somebody like David Buss, uh, who has published a lot of information about his theories. Uh, he attributes the universality of basic personality traits to natural selection because traits such as extroversion and agreeableness ensure physical survival and the reproduction of our species. So those are the magic buzzwords for evolutionary psychology. Now we get into Sigmund Freud, and there's a lot of information that could be said about Sigmund Freud. I mean, you could base an entire course around Freud's theory. But like Piaget, Freud is somebody that you can't you can't really judge until you've 
you've kind of evaluated and understood where he's coming from with his theories. So it doesn't mean that he was correct about everything that he theorized, but it's easy to cast Freudian theory off at first glance until you really get into the details of Freud's writings and Freud's theories and, and, and what, what he proposed. And you see a lot of things that actually kind of line up a lot more than you than you'd care to admit. But the reality is is that a lot of Freudian theory is probably hindsight bias, but it is still profound. There are a lot of things that Freud noticed um, with his patients uh, that that other psychotherapists just just didn't pick up on. So Freud saw saw enough collection of information that that it influenced his his theory. And basically, Freudian theory has to start sorry i missed that freudian theory has to start um with personality you you can't you can't um really move on past freud until you look at what he believed the dynamics of the personality were so in psychoanalytic theory or psychodynamic theory you have um the basis of all humanity which is the conscious and the subconscious so Really, to understand Freud's e ego and personality conflicts between the id and the superego, you have to understand that the idea here is that there is an unconscious or a subconscious conflict that we are largely unaware of as humans. So, for instance, there is a struggle going on in our personality traits between our wants, our 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 instinctive drives, if you will, our 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 homeostatic parasympathetic and sympathetic endocrine hormonal changes as we now know them to be uh, what Freud just called the id uh, and our sense of right and wrong or our sense of, of of what is the correct thing to do which requires a lot of conscious choice so what we feel like doing on the left there with the id and what we know is the correct thing to do on the right with the superego. So to understand the, the internal struggle between the id and the superego, we have to kind of create a character that is the ego. Ego is I. Ego equals self. So there are three parts to the, the, the Freudian trinity of personality, if you will. The ego represents all of the conscious and subconscious things that you are as a person, according to Freud. The id is the most basic, animalistic, subconscious urges and desires that a person can have. The superego is something that develops as we get older and learn right from wrong and decide to make choices. And so there's almost kind of a Lawrence Kohlberg scenario of conventional morality and post-conventional morality of what is the right thing, what is the wrong thing. And it's important to understand that when there's not a conflict between what we want to do or what we're driven by instincts to do, which is the id, and what we think is the right thing to do, then you don't get the defense mechanisms. You don't get the distortion of reality. You don't get the anxiety or the need to defend ourselves because there isn't a conflict there. So really there's only an issue between the superego and the id when they're in conflict with one another. So the ego is who we are. That's the reality principle. The id is, is what we want and how we want to please ourselves. That's the pleasure principle. And the superego is everything that we learn to be correct or right or wrong uh, about any situation. And these are all you know unconscious decisions that we make. So when you look at the metaphor of the iceberg, the mental iceberg represents what Freud believed to be our levels of consciousness. And if you look at the conscious level, which is above the surface, this is kind of uh, the point of the iceberg metaphor here. Those are the things that are we are we are aware of. Those are thoughts, perceptions. Those are things that we have, that we ruminate on, that we can explain to other people. They are explicit. But then you have the pre-conscious level. Those are memories, and those are easily retrieved into our consciousness, but they're not always in our consciousness. And the same thing is true with stored knowledge. You have lots of stored knowledge in your brain that you're not consciously thinking about right now. So Freud would say that's in your pre-conscious level. But if we asked you a trivia question, or if we asked you to sing the, the lyrics to a song, that stored knowledge would very quickly go from your memory in the pre-conscious level into your consciousness, and you would bring it up. And from chapter 7, unit 7, we know that you have a working memory, which is the same thing as Freud's pre-conscious level, and you have your conscious effortful attention, um, and everything else would be you know, stored long-term memories. Where it gets interesting 
and kind of profound and a little bit scary uh, is the unconscious level. And these are the things that, that Freud felt like escaped during hypnosis sessions and in our dreams, which is why he believed so heavily in dream interpretation, because he believed that we have these hidden unconscious desires that are that are almost psychopathic but are very normal but we're ashamed of them because as we get older and we learn the structured civilized society of, of right and wrong then some of these things become inappropriate so for instance your violent motives your road rage if you never learned that it was wrong to get out of your car and attack another person when they cut you off in traffic then you would not be morally conflicted about that so enter the super ego conflict here once you learn from your parents that it is not okay for you to violently attack someone then when you feel the urge to violently attack someone you have a conflict the ego has to decide do i do do i go with this rage that's so real and hard to control or do i kind of tamp that unconscious violent motive down and try to allow myself to make a more um, appropriate decision and that doesn't come without consequences when we repress our violent motives and repress our irrational wishes and we repress our, our shameful experiences our selfish needs if we, when we repress our unacceptable sexual desires that causes tension now what we know that is uh, to be called now is anxiety and in some cases depression but what Freud believed is that those were defense mechanisms of the ego so that we weren't constantly ruminating on the things that we were ashamed of. So Freud believed that all of us have the unconscious ability to turn into violent killers or animalistic, um, irrational people that are out of control. I mean, it doesn't take but one natural disaster before you see what people are capable of. When people are eroded to their most base homeostatic urges, they're not it's not a pretty thing to watch it's not a pleasant thing to to witness to see how people can be degraded i mean even the irony of things like the holidays when you look at like the christmas toy rush uh, in stores and 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 things like um the black friday shopping after thanksgiving and you just kind of see when people are based to their their base human nature it's these unconscious violent motives and unacceptable behaviors and these immoral urges to steal from each other and harm each other they come out they come to the surface so Freud believed that we're all that way um, and so that's where why it's easy for us to chastise and shame someone who who does something horribly unspeakable but in reality according to Freud all of us have that unconscious ability to turn into that person it's the super ego our conscience that prevents us from allowing ourselves to go there so the problem in in Freud's studies is that if you want to tap into who people are at an unconscious level it's unconscious for a reason so you have to tap into their unconscious urges below the surface and you can't do that because the ego is protecting their awareness so if you want to see how violent that you can become you have to be put in a situation where that violence has to come out and that's really not realistic to do in day-to-day -day life i mean unless you read uh, you know, something like Man's Search for Meaning or other Holocaust-related literature, you can see what people turn into um, when they're put in absolute, you know, what Maslow would call the, the physiological state of need. The most basic needs are being denied and people turn into animals. They go into their, their instinctive urge to survive. And so most of us are not in that situation. So at, for, a, for a psychotherapist like Sigmund Freud, to tap into our unconscious, he believed that you had to you had to silence or calm this the the ego and so he did that with free association uh he did that with hypnosis and then and then most importantly and kind of later on in his career he really delved into the world of dream interpretation so freud believed that dreams were the were the royal pathway to the unconscious that if you wanted to get into people's unconscious thoughts you had to really analyze the latent content of their dreams so you see the uh, dream analysis, hypnosis, and free associations, and the goal there is to reveal the unconscious. So when we get into the defense mechanisms of the ego, just keep in mind that if the ego can't, if there's a conflict, if it can't maintain the balance between what you desire to do and the conflicting conscience of no, that's not the right thing to do, 
then what the ego does is it uses a tool from its toolbox, which is the defense mechanisms. So defense mechanisms, simply explained, are tactics that reduce or even redirect anxiety by distorting reality. So you have four R's, the two D's, um, the one P, the one I, and the one S, which that's not a very helpful way to explain it at all. So let's get into the R's, which are most commonly confused with one another, specifically these two terms because they're only one letter different. So repression, you have to look at as a literal term to repress. To repress means to push back, to push it deep into your memory. And so to go, if we could go back to the unconscious of the iceberg, you're going to take something that you're consciously aware of, that you're ashamed of, or say like it's post-traumatic stress, or something that you just can't, it's a, it's a thought that you cannot deal with, you're going to repress that back into the unconscious level and actually block it from your memory. That's repressed memories. Um, regression, though, is the, regress is the opposite of progress. So if progress is to go forward, regress is to go backward. So you see people throwing a fit, you th see people crying, you see people, um, you know, that jump up and down when they stub their toe, you see people uh, doing things that, that this very childish, you see grown adult, middle-aged people, uh, you know, um, acting like children, you know, and, and deflecting and becoming victims and whining and crying. Freud would explain that as a form of regression, where they can't handle and deal with the reality of the situation they're in, so they regress back to a previous state where they are more vulnerable and helpless. So, you know, allowing yourself to become a victim in a situation that you have control over is, is the type of, of learned helplessness that Freud would describe as regression, to go back to uh, a previous state in the stages. And it's usually an infantile state. Acting childish, in other words. Reaction formation is one that, that people tend to mix up on tests. Reaction formation is, is kind of your way to subconsciously control the narrative, if you will. You're forming the reaction that you want people to see. That's why it's called that. So essentially what you're doing is you're putting on a display. You're putting on a, a front. You are reacting in the opposite way that you feel. Right? So, so reaction formation might be that somebody who um, you know is secretly embarrassed that they have a crush on someone that they don't think is an appropriate crush, then they would act the opposite so that they didn't give themselves away. Right? They might kind of act moody and not pay attention and throw a fit and and uh, but throwing a fit is kind of problematic. It makes it sound like they're regressing back, and maybe they are. But a better example would be that they they would act completely um, uh, icy and cold and, and try to shut people out. So you can kind of see that reaction formation play out um, in a lot of teenage relationships, whether they be romantic or just platonic. Rationalization is a very common one. That's this tendency when we feel guilty for something that we did, especially if we've been caught um, in a lie or if we've been caught in, in something where we're wrong and we've been called out by somebody, we don't own it. We, we rationalize or make excuses about why it was appropriate behavior and, we, and we, you know, we, we basically create a reason why we did what we did. And, and, and in so doing, it's not so much that we don't admit that we weren't wrong, we're not in denial, it's just that we make excuses for why we did what we did as if that somehow makes it better. Displacement, though, displacement is when you take some urge and it's usually something that's like a, a hot emotional state, a positive emotion, like rage. Um, but Freud even described it as, as um, repressed sexuality um, that people couldn't deal with, right? So they had sexual urges that either were deemed inappropriate by society, uh, maybe they, were, uh, they had same-sex attraction, they were homosexual and it was not acceptable, or maybe they were young and they had sexual attraction for... Uh, somebody who was older or a classmate or a peer and they had no way to to really um, to, to in a healthy way to, to display that sexuality or, or to, to burn off that sexual energy so they would displace it right so displaced anger is a scary thing displaced sexual aggression is a scary thing also it can, it can be a scary thing so displacement is think think in terms of displacing means to place in an inappropriate location so you're taking out your anger on something that is safer something that is not so um, troubling but it, it definitely doesn't solve your problem denial obviously some people they don't rationalize when they get caught 
um, dead in a lie or in uh, something where they were wrong. They might actually deny that they were wrong. They just they just refuse to believe that something is the case. And a lot of times when people use the Freudian example of denial, they talk about things like, well, a loved one or a family member has died and somebody's in denial about that. It's not just um, that they refuse to accept facts about things that are logical. They can refuse to accept responsibility for things also. They're just in denial uh, that something bad has happened or that they have, uh, that they've been caught or that they're guilty. Projection. Projection is, is something that you, you probably see and do more often than you realize unless you're looking for it. Projection is when you assume something in other people and it's like an insecurity that you have. Right, so if you have body image issues, you might accuse other people of body shaming you. Right, so if you have uh, identity crises or, or confusion about your sexuality, you might project onto other people um, that, that, that they are abusive or that they are um, um, misguided or even that they are um, sexually frustrated or confused themselves. Uh, so projection is when you take your emotional baggage and you and you throw it at other people. You project it onto other people. Intellectualization. Um, this is not one that you see in every psychological textbook, but it's definitely a Freudian defense mechanism. That's throwing yourself into academic pursuits instead of focusing on your emotional problems. And wow, that one is deep enough that we could spend an entire uh, video on the level of intellectualization as a way to deflect your problems and ignore things and I'm just gonna leave that where it is and not go anywhere else with that one sublimation would be channeling this would be the healthier form of displacement rather than displacing your anger in an inappropriate place you use a physical outlet that's acceptable you channel your unacceptable feelings say like rage you get cut off in traffic and you know it's not morally correct for you to attack someone and so what you do is you go home and you go for a jog or you go home and you you know punch a pillow or scream into a pillow or you know hit a body bag in your garage and a lot of people have a hard time distinguishing between sublimation and displacement well screaming into your pillow is not harming anyone or anything but kicking your dog or screaming at your little brother that there's a victim on the other end of that so displacement ha it, it causes harm to somebody who's undeserving you can't make the case that your pillow was undeserving. Uh, so, so sublimation would be a healthy way to channel unacceptable feelings, usually rage. So now to get into the regression of things, you have to look at Freud's psychosexual stages. So he believed that, that a lot of our unconscious guilt was based on things that like like sexuality and Freud's sexuality is is something that people want to reject and it's very uncomfortable for them to think about but Freud was ahead of his time in in this regard he he knew how natural human sexuality was but he also lived in a time in the 20th the early first half of the 20th century in in Europe where it was a very sexually repressed society that he lived in and it wasn't that people didn't know about sexuality or participate in sexuality it was that it wasn't talked about it wasn't discussed and it certainly wasn't it didn't have a place in the 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 psychoanalytic or the medical fields and so what freud believed is that a lot of people's frustrations and anxieties were actually pent up sexual aggression um, and and what he called that is a fixation it's trapped sexual energy um, that, that was never fully realized or fully developed in a stage. And so he believed that there were, there were important psychosexual stages that every person went through. Um, and again, it wasn't always about sexual gratification, but it was about uh, physical gratification. So um, in the stage of, of being an infant, in the oral stage, and babies are not sexually motivated but and they don't really have a sexuality or, or, or sexual urges but they do they do have instinctive urges and so you think about how babies experience the world kind of like Piaget's sensory motor stage <laughs> everything that is real and immediate to them are things that they can see and touch and feel they don't have concepts for things before about 18 months uh, they don't have schemas for things um, and so Freud kind of overlaps Piaget in that way. He believed that babies were just little animals and they're instinctive and they're completely driven by their 
emotions. They're completely motivated by their urges. And so think about what a baby's urge is. is to eat, is to sleep, right? And so babies are like puppies. Their teeth start coming in and they chew on things and they drool everywhere uh, and, and they're colicky and they cry and they complain. They, 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 they have no way to emotionally understand the feelings that they're going through. And so the oral stage is all centered around gratification and calming them, pacifying them orally, which is why it's called the oral stage. So it's not called a pacifier uh, by accident. A pacifier is something that calms a baby down because their, their, their source of, of, of calming is going to come from occupying their mouth, right? And that comes from breastfeeding. And then you get into the anal stage, and the anal stage is toddlers. Uh, 18 to about 36 months and that is when children become very blatantly aware of their bowel movements and their bladder control and that becomes the struggle during the anal stage so it's potty training and it's a source of frustration and it's a source of um, uh, of guilt when they have accidents and they get yelled at by their parents and then you get into the phallic stage from three to six years, um, and then you get um, genital stimulation. You get the children basically become aware of their body parts. They become aware of their uh, for all of body parts. And you might think that looks a little weird to see three to six years old um, at genital stimulation or masturbation, but there are some studies that show that babies as young as nine months old um, will stimulate their genitals um, because they realize that it feels good. So it's it's something that is <coughs> instinctive in humans just like in many animals then you get in and really during that phallic stage of three to six is when they start to gain their sort of gender identity they know okay well i'm a boy and dad is a boy so i have to act like boys act and so that's where that idea of the the masculine gender typing comes about and the same thing is true with the girls and then what you get during this phallic stage is you get this obsession with being just like the same sex parent and being compatible for the opposite sex parent and so you know well dad and mom are together and so dad and mom are a couple and dad and mom that's the family structure that's what the family unit looks like and so boys marry girls and the girl that i know and like the best is mom and so you get the oedipus complex and you get the electric complex and that comes about as they're exploring the world uh, of their 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 gender typing and so again it seems this all seems very crazy to wrap our minds around but you have you can't sexualize a three-year-old you can't think about a, a five-year-old in terms of they're sexually attracted to their parent i mean it's deviant enough without making it what freud didn't intend it to be and again it doesn't mean it's right i'm not a, a, a freud apologist but at the same time you, you have to understand what he intended and not not how we kind of bastardize it so after the the very strong feminization and masculine masculinization whatever that word would be uh, of of gender typing you get what freud called this latency period and latency is a is, is a specifically used term from six to about puberty you really don't see much gender typing changes so a six-year-old kid and a, and a ten-year-old kid you really don't see a lot of change in they have opposite sex play you know they play sports together there's really not this the, there's not a, a competition between boys and girls that's tied directly to their gender typing there's really not a whole lot to separate elementary school age kids biologically they are similar they haven't hit puberty and so they can compete um, in the same sports and, and participate in the same activities and so you get this latent period where there's really not a lot of sexual activity going on and then you hit puberty and Freud believed puberty was, you know, from puberty on was the, the ongoing pursuit for sexual gratification. And that was the development of sexuality. And that's when you became motivated to, to stimulate um, genitally, uh, which is why he called the genital stage, basically the stage where um, sexuality starts to actually develop and mature in people. And that's your sexual identity. So let's get into, into some of the Neo-Freudians. You have Carl Jung, you have Alfred Adler, and you have Karen Horney. Um, Anna Freud also would be considered a Neo-Freudian. Anna Freud, his daughter, was the one who published his works after he died, um, which is why the world kind of knows who Freud is, because she published a lot of his his papers and things like that. So again, Freud has gotten some, some flack from people who... who 
critique and pick apart his work when he didn't intentionally put this information out to the world. It was more his observations and theories and hypotheses. And of course, he was not around to to suffer through peer review or or to defend his position or explain or expand or anything like that. So <laughs> in that way, it's kind of hard to analyze Freud more than surface level because you don't really know how much of this he intended to really be mainstream pop psychology. So Carl Jung um, is probably the, the most contemporary to Freud. Uh, specifically, he believed in things like personal unconscious, just like Freud did. That's why he's considered a neo-Freudian. He's still a psychoanalyst. Um, so the pre-conscious and the unconscious, we store past memories, but we also have a hidden instinct. We have an urge uh, center, which is the id. Uh, Jung also believed in something that he called the collective unconscious, and this was more evolutionary and genetic. It was a powerful and influential system of the psyche, which is the mind, that contains universal memories and ideas. We call those instincts. Um, that people have inherited from our ancestors over the course of evolution. So essentially, <clears throat> that would be things like snakes are bad and fire is good. Um, you know, the desire for sexual stimulation and um, food that is cooked and things like that. That's that's what Jung would have considered the collective unconscious, the just genetic instincts, uh, instinctive drives that pass down uh, through genera uh, generations of, of breeding. So here's Carl Jung. Um, this is Jung towards the end of his life. Um, Jung was very influential, not just in psychoanalytics, but but very influential in, in a lot of different fields. Um, dream interpretation, um, evolutionary psychology, uh, consciousness and unconsciousness, archetypes, but also um, even in personality traits. How much of them are, are evolutionarily sound, how much of them are archetypal, and they pass down um, through our species. In fact, it's Carl Jung's personality theories that that make up the explanations of the Myers-Briggs personality type indicator. So there's 16 different personality dimensions and you rank in four different dimensions, four different categories and that that's that that stems from Carl Jung's work. There are other neo-Freudians um, they, they were similar to Freud in that they accepted a lot of his baseline theories, but rejected some of his other theories that were more controversial. Uh, Adler, for one, um, I'll show you a picture of Adler on the next slide, but he uh, emphasized social interest um, as the primary determinant of your behavior. So basically, he's like Erickson in that way. He believed that, that your interactions with your, your peers in society and in your community had a lot to do with how you behaved. He also believed in birth order theory. Birth order theory is is very uniquely Adler's. And so this idea of middle child syndrome and the baby of the family and the only child syndrome. And you see a lot of, when you compare Carl Jung's Myers-Briggs personality types with Alfred Adler's birth order, there's a lot of interesting things that match up there. Now, of course, we can't eliminate whether or not those are environmental. In fact, parents may raise their children differently um, based on when they were born and also the sibling dynamic is different for first children, middle children, young children, and things like that. So birth order theory is, is definitely founded, but it may not necessarily be genetic. It could be something that's environmental. The other thing that Adler was, um, was attributed for was his inferiority and superiority complexes. That's kind of part of his birth order theory. Um, basically that we try to compensate based on what we see as inadequacies in ourselves. Karen, um, Karen Horney is uh, another psychoanalytic uh, neo-Freudian, uh, and she kind of, probably not surprisingly, brought a more feminist touch to the psychoanalytic theories that were Freud's. Um, Freud believed in a theory called penis envy, that there was a part of the unconscious that, that people had uh, during the phallic stage was that women, um, or girls rather, when they were little, um, developed uh, this envy that they did not have male genitalia and uh, Karen Horney's like response to that was what she referred to as womb envy that, that, that there was male guilt and fascination with the ability to create life um, and that um, men especially after they were boys um, valued and envied this in women that they were able to, to get pregnant and carry babies there's Adler. Um, looks like a real 
chipper, happy-go-lucky guy, doesn't he? So you get the superiority complex, the inferiority complex, sibling rivalry, and that comes from birth order theory. There is Karen Horney. Um, again, inner conflict. She did believe in the unconscious and psychoanalytic theory, um, but did not buy into penis envy. Although, ironically, she did buy into womb envy. Now we get into other personality theorists that are uh, very, very, very worth noting. For instance, this guy right here, Hans Eysenck. Eysenck, believe it or not, we just got done talking about Freud and Neo-Freudians. Hans Eysenck is the single most cited psychologist in, 20, in the 20th century uh, psychological uh, uh, published uh, journals and books. So to say that another way, Eysenck has been cited more than Freud, more than Piaget, more than Skinner, more than William James, more than Wundt. So I think in his personality theories ha have really influenced psychology in the second half of the 20th century into the 21st century. <clears throat> in fact, a lot of people who study socioeconomics uh, look at I think's big five personality traits. And the big five didn't start out as five. It started out as, as three personality uh, profiles. And, and when you look up I think's name, you probably get the wheel. And the wheel has four different dimensions on it. It has introversion versus extroversion, and it has um, agreeableness, uh, I'm sorry, it has uh, neuroticism versus stability, so how stable are you? So here's how you interpret what you're looking at here. This is the big five personality traits, and it's a sliding scale in five different personality domains, right? So if you like the acronym of OCEAN, more than canoe that's how you can remember the words but you are either open or not open not everyone is open so it's where you fall on the openness scale if you have a low score in the openness scale you're more practical you're more conventional you prefer routines if you have a high score you're more curious you're going to be more sporadic you're going to be more spontaneous open to new experiences think conscientiousness is the c Conscientiousness is if you score high on the conscientious scale, it's competent, self-disciplined, you're goal-driven, you're thoughtful, you're studious, hardworking, and dependable. If you're low on the conscientious scale, you would be an impulsive person who's careless, disorganized, maybe even lazy. Um, it's kind of interesting when you look at studies, I mentioned this in another video that you can watch about inequality and, and intelligence, the, the number one indicator of, of the wealthiest people in the Western world is intelligence, which is kind of disheartening because there's not a whole lot you can do about that. But the number two indicator, the number two predictive uh, factor of of wealth in the Western world is ISYNC's conscientiousness trait. So when you take people who are extremely successful in whatever endeavor and you measure them in the big five personality traits, they almost always rank high. And conscientiousness so that is a trait that can be developed that's something that you want to have if you're going to be successful in life you have to be conscientious at least if we're to believe the statistics you want to be dependable you want to be organized you want to be disciplined you want to be able to time manage you want to be able to understand the value and importance of certain things that's conscientiousness so these things are not unfounded there's a lot of things like I said he's the most cited uh, person in in psychological uh, journals and then you get the other traits, extroversion. Extroversion is a little bit, it's more common of a term that we use, refers to how outgoing people are. If you're low on the extroverted scale, you would be what's called an introvert. You're quiet, reserved, even withdrawn from social situations. You may not enjoy social situations. You may um, even be uh, somebody who gets panicked in social situations. And if you rank high on the extroversion scale, you would be outgoing, warm, adventurous, um, sociable. You would have high levels of empathy, uh, meaning that you could detect what other people were experiencing. You could read a room well, uh, things like that. So being extroverted is not necessarily a uh, must, but it is something that's, that's a valuable trait um, when it comes to working with other people. The agreeableness scale is a big one for personality um, uh, traits in relationships, how you relate to other people. Um, 
critical if you if you're low meaning you're not agreeable you would be critical of other people you'd be uncooperative you'd be suspicious if you rank high on the agreeableness scale you would be helpful trusting empathetic uh, so being agreeable means other people get along with you it's easy to agree with you it's easy to to get along with you in social settings so being agreeable is is a very important trait when you're trying to match with somebody who's compatible so myers briggs is very good for say like business personality um, clusters of of personality types but i think big five is better for things like um, dating websites you know dating apps and stuff like that they can use your extroversion scale your conscientious scale how open to new experiences you are how agreeable you are so if you think okay i'm um quiet and reserved i'm hardworking and dependable i'm practical and conventional you may not pair very well with somebody who's curious and impulsive you definitely wouldn't pair very well with somebody maybe who was you know super outgoing and bubbly or maybe you know maybe there's certain traits where you can balance other people out but the big five personality traits are used a lot um, in dating apps uh, to find compatible uh, matches in people and the last one neuroticism in no particular order really it's just an acronym but neuroticism is one of the original three how mentally stable are you so tendency towards unstable emotions if you are neurotic you are mentally unstable anxious unhappy prone to negative emotions you tend to ruminate on things so people who are very uptight high strung anxious people would be neurotic they're constantly um, feeling victimized they're constantly looking for uh, foul play they're constantly uh, seeing negatives they're constantly um, stressing out over things that are a minor deal that's being neurotic now stressing out because something is is happening like oh my house is on fire well you should be stressed about that but when you're stressed out about things that are not consequential that's that's defined as neuroticism especially if it's all the time so the opposite of being neurotic would be calm even tempered or secure so be prepared I, w I went into a lot of detail there I know it took a few minutes but I, I'm, I'm just I'm just weary of uh, a leery excuse me of, of you getting asked a specific big five trait as has happened on multiple previous FRQs they'll use conscientiousness specifically or they'll use extroversion or agreeableness so just be prepared to use the specific personality trait and how you remember them is ocean or if you like canoe better you can use canoe and that's Hans icing the behavioral approach to personality again this would be somebody like Skinner operant conditioning if you're rewarded for doing some behavioral trait then you're going to continue the behavior so like when you're in middle school if you act silly in class and get in trouble and your peers like that uh, then you're going to be rewarded and it's going to reinforce the behavior the humanistic approach we talked about maslow um, in the last chapter um, that would be uh, self-actualization um, which means to achieve your full potential as a person Carl Rogers is another humanist. Uh, again, if you've been around me long enough, you know how I feel about humanistic psychology. I'm a huge fan. It's self-help psychology. It's positive psychology. It's not focusing on what we do wrong. It's not focusing on what's wrong with us or, or how we're bad. It's more how do we get where we want to be, right? So again, humanists like um, Viktor Frankl, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning, or, or Carl Rogers, uh, Gordon Alport, uh, Martin Seligman is a favorite of a lot of people uh, they help people get to to their best fulfilled self so what Carl Rogers did was he he came up with this like client client centered therapy and the idea was unconditional positive regard it was a safe space he had to build up a trust level uh, with his patients and so that he could it was the opposite of Freudian psychology where he sat sits behind you and scribbles notes instead of what freud did he didn't analyze your your unconscious drives he sat in front of you with 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 positive and unassuming body language that was approachable he had empathetic facial features he would lean forward he would repeat things that you said he had an entire structured way of hosting a session that he called active listening right so there was an entire design behind how he even interacted with his his patients and basically the whole idea was to build an unconditional positive regard in them so they could love and accept themselves 
for who they are, regardless of their faults, and they can learn to identify their faults, and they can move forward. So it was Carl Rogers that came up with the idea instead of calling them clients instead of patients, uh, so they didn't feel sick and they didn't need to be healed, uh, and that has kind of stuck. And, and mental health professionals still to this day, they will use the term client. So to get into Maslow, we, we talked in depth, if you want to look more detail about Maslow's uh, pyramid uh, or hierarchy of needs, you can watch the, um, the, the Unit 9 developmental video. Carl Rogers, uh, again, is our, our, our unconditional positive regard. Very influential, especially in pop psychology. Influenced uh, later psychologists such as Aaron Beck. Uh, who came up with cognitive behavioral therapy, which is teaching people uh, their anxiety and their depression, their triggers, finding your triggers and learning how to train your thought processes so that you could overcome um, your negative thoughts and what he called cognitive distortions, blaming yourself and things like that. So empathy, acceptance, understanding, all in the name of personal growth, which is what humanism is all about. Bandura came up in the learning chapter, unit six. Uh, Bandura's social cognitive theory is basically that you witness, you see modeled behavior. If you look at the triangle there, and modeled behavior is training. It's not just like Skinner where we're rewarding you or punishing you, but you're witnessing what happens at home. So the whole idea behind the social cognitive theory is this idea that when people witness, say, like a, a violent model at home or a drug abuse model, an alcoholic model, Essentially, that's an environmental factor, which is going to influence their behaviors, which is going to get strengthened by other environmental factors. And that's what's known as reciprocal determinism, right? So reciprocal determinism is essentially when an environmental factor affects your behavior, which affects the environmental factor, which affects your behavior. That's reciprocal. It reciprocates back and forth. So for instance, let's say that somebody who is your teacher has a very negative tone about them and they have a very negative personality well that might make you a bitter student well when you have a class full of bitter students it's not going to make the teacher more chipper it's going to make them more you know it's going to make them more icy and it's going to make them uh, more bitter themselves and so you get reciprocal determinism so that an environmental factor affects the behavior which just strengthens the environmental factor which affects the behavior and maybe a better example is the student who does not like school goes to school acts up in class gets in trouble which just reinforces the fact that they don't like school it's it's reciprocal determinism it's environment and behavior and environment and behavior environment and behavior you get in trouble at school so your parents yell at you which makes you rebel so you get in trouble at school so your parents yell at you so you get you, you get in trouble at school and they yell it's just a reciprocating never-ending behavioral loop so three types of behavior according to the cognitive uh the social cognitive theory personality characteristics and cognitive processes again we have thought processes and behaviors uh the nature frequency and intensity of your actions how often do you get in trouble at school how often do you lash out and then stimuli from your environment Right? Again, is there a reason why you're acting this way at school? Is it because you have a bad model at home, uh, etc.? Uh, locus of control is, is a huge, huge topic with me. Um, I've spent a lot of time talking about this. I could probably write a dissertation on what, what I believe the victim's mentality um, and what I think is the single greatest um, prevention of success in our society today is locus of control. It's the degree to which we expect the reinforcement or outcome of our behavior is based or contingent upon our own behavior or characteristics versus whether it is reinforcement based on luck or fate or under the control of others or is not something that you can predict. So in other words, to clean that up, do you believe that the source of whatever it is is something that is inside of your control and because of your actions which would be internal or is it something that's outside of your control and we've talked about this extensively um, if you don't believe if you believe the system is stacked against you that is external that's not something you control which means that it, it, it's it's you are not the source of your problems and therefore you cannot be the source of your solutions so you are not empowered to fix your financial situation if you don't believe 
you're the reason for your financial situation. So some of the best financial literacy that people can get is building an internal locus of control, learning how much is in their control. But when we blame things, and again, that's not to say that things don't exist in the world, that privilege doesn't exist, that racism and prejudice doesn't exist, that sexism doesn't exist, that you know some people have an easier lot in life, but that's a starting point. That's not an ending point, right? My 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 preferred metaphor for for success in life, at least in our society, is is the poker game. That you can't control the the cards that you're dealt, but you do get to control how you play your hand. And you can scream and cry about how unfair your hand is, but it's luck of the draw, man. I mean, you don't get to to pick who your parents are any more than you get to pick what gender or what what skin color you are. It's just not something that you get to decide before entering into this world. And so, if you have an external locus of control, then you find the outcomes in your life outside of your control. And that's problematic. It's like learned helplessness. If you don't believe that you can change your situation, then why would you ever act to change your situation? But if you believe that you're the the source of your your solutions then then you'll act to fix those so internal versus external locus of control is is a type of social learning theory and like i said that's 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 a book that's a dissertation based on julian rotter's theory that um that has been extensively studied uh and it's something that that this is a topic that i'm very very kind of we'll say triggered by uh gordon alport uh his trait theory uh, i'll show you gordon alport on the next slide um, is relatively permanent characteristic of our personality uh, that can be used to predict our behavior. Uh, Alport is a humanist. He was a, a psychologist that was the, based in social traits and personality traits. Um, he was a follower, I don't say a follower, he was a person that studied the work of Viktor Frankl, um, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning. He was um, someone who very much uh, bought into that field of study which was known as logotherapy um, that if you create purpose in your suffering then you can essentially um, make it out of anything um, and that is a type of internal locus of control uh, so that's Gordon Alport hi I think we talked very extensively about his personality dimensions the big five personality of what started as the big three uh, and so there's Alport uh, basically he believed in cardinal traits um, that you these are these are your dominant personality characteristics that you were born with um, and he believed in things that were central traits so you have cardinal traits and central traits uh, that these are personality traits that are rigid and then you have more secondary traits and those are things that are probably environmentally influenced and those might be a little bit more you know influenced by your peers uh, finally, assessment techniques. Some of these are more effective than others. Things like Rorschach inkblot tests. You have thematic apperception tests, which is the TAT, um, and that's where they show you a picture, and you have to um, basically they are analyzing your unconscious mind by showing you an image, and then you have to create a backstory for what's happening in the image. So it's kind of a type of Freudian subconscious evaluation and the inkblot test which is not very scientific either that's that's a type of psychoanalysis as well that basically what you see when you look at that inkblot test uh, whether it's an angry elephant and that inkblot to the right there or whether or not it's angels or whatever it is that you see um, is supposed to tell us a lot about what's happening in your unconscious mind because the ego cannot protect you from that it's just an unconscious subliminal thought that pops up. So inkblot tests are not very scientifically valid and nor are TAT, uh, the thematic apperception test. The halo effect is the tendency to generalize a favorable impression to unrelated dimension uh, of uh, other subjects, personality traits, and that's when you're analyzing things like uh, a factor analysis of various different personality traits. That's not really something I've ever seen on an AP exam. Uh, but the Hawthorne effect I have seen on AP exams before. The Hawthorne effect is is what happens is I'll put it this way: the Hawthorne effect is is the reason why naturalistic observation exists. So let me say that again: naturalistic observation exists because of something that's known as the Hawthorne effect, and that is when you know that you're being evaluated and you know what behavior is being evaluated, you tend to perform, whether it's conscious or not. It, it, it's not an accurate 
depiction. So if you want to see how teachers act in the classroom, you can't announce your presence, you have to show up. And if you want to see how children act, you can't tell them when you're going to be there, you have to show up. So when people know they're being observed, they change their behavior to what they think the observer expects. And that, of course, is not for accuracy, it's to make them look good. So that's known as the Hawthorne effect. And that brings us to the end of Unit 10. It's a long, grueling video, but a lot of information from Unit 10. And hopefully that review helps you. Uh, unit 11 is a much shorter chapter, but it's it's got some, some key stuff in it um, that the College Board wants you to, knew, to know. Excuse me. So stay tuned for Unit 11.